Welcome to our presentation. We're going to talk about um, the Twangy book and particularly the um, politics and conclusions chapters. So I'm going to talk a bit about the fact that um, the iGeners tend to not support mainstream political candidates. They really, in the 2016 election, they gravitated towards Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. They really saw Hillary Clinton as more representing the establishment, so they don't really think she would bring a lot of change. And um, some of them even decided to vote for Trump when Sanders lost the Democratic nominee. And it seems strange to me when I have this idea of them being more liberal, but they are really just true to themselves over a political party. It's more important that they support what they believe than that. And um, they, they also are really political independents. They're reluctant to join a group and follow the rules. They don't trust um, the government or its efficiency. And they don't really trust people who represent the government, such as, um, such as Clinton. Uh, someone less mainstream with new ideas is more likely to make a difference in their mind, such as Sanders with his social, socialism and Trump with his nationalism. And I am a, a millennial, but I'm at the end of millennials, so I kind of relate to some things with the I Jenners, and I see some of their tendencies in me. And I definitely struggled to trust the government. I also don't really like the political system because you're assigned things to believe in the one you join. And I have beliefs which are um, independent of a party, and I, I want a political party to fit them, not exactly to adapt. So I understand that independence and individuality kind of thing in the I Jenners. Um, and this, this uh, graph here is from the Women and Political Institute. It's a 2019 graph. And they show the divide between I Jenners. They're really split between the political parties. And there's also a lot of them who are independent. Um, and according to Maggie Astor in a recent NPR article, many I Jenners um, early in this, this election season were leaning towards Sanders and Warren. And now that those are not options, I wonder if they will accept Biden, who is very establishment, or if they're going to end up siding with Trump because he's more mainstream. So we'll have to see. All right. We see, we see that um, in chapter 10, we, under the topic of politics, we see that uh, conservatism is one of the key things that uh, we wanted to look into. And here, uh, we will focus our attention on the rise in conservatism. Uh, so there are three key factors that we noted here in this, uh, in this group during our uh, discussion and review of the chapter. So from the book itself, we see that on page 263, one of the things that we discover is that the the political independence is the lead cause of the rise of conservatives or conservativeness in the I genus. And aside from that, another thing that we discover is the matter of what the party of identification for the I genus look like. So they are more like individualistic and reasons for, the, for their choices is something that is causing the rise in the of them being conservative. And finally, one of the three points that we noted also is that the number of the hygiene conservatives uh, has greatly grown uh, since the 2000s, uh, from the beginning of 2000 to present. And all of this has been noted on page uh, 264. Now, if you look at the graph, you see the rising conservativeness uh, among the hygienists and the millennials. So, uh, we can see clearly what the graph uh, speak to and how the rise in conservativeness among the hygienists is really being noted here. So the question is, why is the rise? We, we noted uh, two key factors for the rise in the conservativeness of the hygienists. Number one, we see that hygienists are concerned about this uh, shortage of resources. For example, uh, you heard um, uh, Stephanie talking about them, and here one of the concerns for them is being nationalistic in terms of they, they are concerned about their jobs and they are concerned about land, and that is one of the key factors that cause the rise. Another thing is the political reason, and in the political reason, we noted two things. One is that uh, these hygienists, they don't have 
a candidate of their own choice or uh, seen or being represented on the ballot box. Next is that we look at that uh, they are really politically independent. So some of them are, is their first time voting. So they become independent in this. Uh, my topic was political issues. And one thing that I uh, have noticed is that um, we all have uh, noticed that a lot of the, um, of the topics that we've had, one of the, the, the themes is individualism or being individualistic. And, and what happens with the iGeners, they have developed a care, don't care attitude. Um, individualism um, shows up where they have reluctance, reluctance to join uh, groups. They are sort of middle of the, of the road, not knowing their political party uh, because they have not taken the time to learn about what goes into the political parties. Uh, for example, there was a, um, an example uh, mentioned by Twangy about Rob, who was 19. He decided to take a political quiz rather than look at the issues of the political parties. So that's just one example of, um, of the Gen, uh, Gen Zers who um, have taken individualistic views uh, um, uh, in politics, but haven't really done the, the deep work to um, determine which way they're gonna go. So for the older Gen Zers who are a little bit more politically astute, what we see, um, are, there's, there is some decrease in the Democratic um, viewpoint, and there's an increase in the Republican and independent um, viewpoint. And you can surmise that the independent and Republican ideologies, uh, it seems like they don't really care that much about social issues, um, but they do care uh, as liberals. So, um, what we found is that Gen Zers are, are single party, uh, single issue voters um, because they care about individual choices. Uh, they don't care who the candidate is so long as the issue that, that is being uh, voted on doesn't affect them um, or it doesn't hurt anyone else in the process. Also, they care about how the money is, how the money is spent as long as it's not spent on social issues. Um, which calls into question um, how they're making their decisions because social programs are what we are called to do. Through social programs, we're called to take care of the least of these. They don't care. They don't seem to care much about traditional, and, and I emphasize traditional um, moral issues such as homosexuality, same-sex marriages, um, or cannibal, uh, cannabis use. Um, their views seem to oppose um, a, a Christian walk. And the, one of the um, iGeners, uh, Gen Zers, um, came from a devout evangelical Christian background. And they are the ones that didn't really care that much about the traditional um, moral issues. Um, we also saw, saw some moderates. The I Jenners seem to be moving toward polarization. They care about nationalism and isolationism, but they don't really care about compromise and cooperation. And that seems to have come up in the um, Trump era a little bit more. They were we're more po we are more polarized than we were 40 years ago um, in terms of extremes we're more politically, the, the people at the extremes are a little bit more politically active. Um, they care to be seen as tolerant, but they don't really care to be, to understand the views of minority Gen Zers who are telling them their experiences and not being, and, and they're not being heard or understood, um, or nor are they concerned. There was a quote that Twenge, um brought forward. It says, in my naive little brain, I never imagined that 48% of white people aged 18 to 29 would vote for a man who based his platform on racism, sexism, xenophobia, homophobia, and so much more. She signed, she signed a little, she, she signed a little, a letter. She signed her letter. I'm sorry. She signed her letter. A black millennial who has now, who has, who now has to be aware that nearly 50% of white people my age don't believe I deserve basic human rights. 
So when discussing six major issues, cannabis legalization, abortion, death penalty, gun control, national health care, and governmental um, environmental regulations, they've concluded, um, so we conclude that from a 24 year old, it seems, he summed it up this way. I speak my truth. I will always be honest and stand in my truth. I have moderate conservative and libertarian views. I am human. I will never apologize to anyone for being an independent thinker. So with that, I, we, we can conclude that this care, don't care, political ideology doesn't seem to coincide with theological underpinnings and is so individualistic that we as adults need to figure out why, the why of it all, and how to move it back toward the middle of the road because nobody wants to be on the road to Emmaus and not recognize Jesus. All right, so we, uh, we look at one of the other factors and in the conclusion part of the book that is affecting uh, the hygienists currently. So that is the technology addiction. As you can see from this uh, picture, you can see uh, a clear uh, writing from here that really speak volume to all of us. A generation under influence of smartphone. Well, look at the three uh, young hygienists standing there. Everyone is paying attention to their phone and none of them is even paying attention to the next. So they all are paying attention. So we can see how they are really under the influences of shaping this generation and being the first generation to really go with this. So in fact, that was one of the topics that we deliberated in our uh, group discussion prior to concluding into this uh, various slides that we put together. Um, so the question is, can we uh, harness the positive trends while mitigating the negative? I love that under that picture. But let's look at two important factors here about this hygienist. It is clear that they are addicted and they, on their phone, the fact is they know it themselves, that they are addicted to their phones. And in fact, this is all discussed in detail uh, in page, on page 291 as noted here. And you can see how the, a lot of them, so many scenarios we are given, how the hygienists are really addicted to their phones. Some of them go to the extent of just locking themselves in the, in the room and just being by themselves as you can even see evident in this picture. The next one is um, the hygienists and the millennials almost or always keep their phone on night. That is one of the very important point we wanted to really mention here. You can see that some of them will put their earpiece in their ear and they will sleep with it because they are so glued to technology. Uh, you know, when phone notification come, they want to see what is happening. They want to go on, on Twitter. They want to go on Facebook. They want to go, they want to WhatsApp. So they sleep with their phones. So what are the causes of this addiction? We look at a few of them. Number one, we see that increase in loneliness and depression is one of the reasons why the hygienists are really addicted to uh, the, the technology. We look at that... Uh, the screen time has led them directly to more unhappiness. So sometimes uh, they, they find themselves lonely. So the only thing that keep them is the phone. So they get onto it and no, nothing much they can concentrate. So they get themselves there. It causes depression for them. And we look at, I look at the, the feeling excitement, the way uh, they see things, the way they view things, the way they, 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 they look at things. And of course, they their relationships. Some of them, uh, they, they get on these forms and they get to date, they get to do other things that are on call for. And some of them get on this technology uh, equipment or form, whether it's form or computer, just to make sure they are acquainted with information. They want to be updated with information. Another one is the online pleasures that come along with it. They enjoy sometimes the comedy they see on the phone, on those, as they scroll through their phones or maybe they browse the net, the online pleasure that they get out of it. 
peer pressure, the conversation, all of this contributing to the addiction of purpose. All right, what can we do to help save this current generation who are so much addicted to uh, technology? So we want to look at this, uh, saving hygienists from tech, technology addiction. Uh, we'll look at a few key things. Number one, we as adults need to be a very good role model to them. Uh, we need to be good role, role model in the same way. We want to make sure, in fact, in the book is discussed that Sometimes if you get, if you buying a phone for your child, you want to make sure you put some apps into this phone that will help the, that will restrict the child from overusing the phone. So for instance, I have my phone, my phone sometimes it tells me where I set my phone to the point that when it is time to go to bed, my phone will notify me that it's time to go to bed. And so if I'm going to bed, it will, it will not provide me any notification of any nature until that time that I set it up is over, my phone will silence every notification that come in. So as adult, one of the way we can help save the, this current generation of hygienists is to be able to help them uh, restrict to some extent the forms that we give our children or the kind of technological equipment we give them. And so like using apps that monitor, like I said, and limit the child's uh, smartphone use, and then also talking to the child about the underlying issues. We need to talk to them, especially as youth. If, we, if you have the opportunity to serve as a youth minister in the church, you want to use this as one of the topics you can discuss with them and tell them the important, how they will be able to, be, uh, to, to restrain themselves from using the form to the excess. Next, please. All right, so we will do an activity to relate to how we will be able to get the youth concentrated on something else rather than just technology. So we want to remove them from being addicted to technology. And this activity is all about blast off. So we will look at two things that we want to achieve in this activity, the big idea and the, the scriptural component of it. Next, please. So we will start the activity with our music and right after the music, we will be able to jump outside and then we'll be able to do the activity. All of this is to make sure we get ourselves uh, concentrated. So now we will get outside and then we will form a, we will form a cycle or we'll say it by peers and then the instructions that are labeled here, we'll be able to share the instruction clearly also, also will be able to help the physically challenged individuals to be able to be included into this activity. And so the idea, like we mentioned, is to see how all of us can be able to spend time with God uh, rather than being addicted to technology. So we want to be addicted with God. That is a big idea here, to be addicted with God rather than technology. And so, as we see here, the, we get the entire instruction in the, in the whole role play or uh, in this activity. So we will follow all of this instruction and then just like you see the racket blow and then it, it, it's just to uh, put us together to reach to the key activity area. So each, each and every youth will be involved into this activity. So at the count of three or uh, two and one, we will move and everyone will shout, blast off and then once we shout then we'll get together again and then we'll move how we can get addicted to god rather than technology so we definitely want to in order to get addicted to god we want to cons consider the story that is recorded in luke chapter 10 verses 38 and uh through 42 which talk about jesus mary and mother so in there we see one person being or concentrated on something and then they another is concentrated and getting addicted to God. We want to pay attention to that and then you will be able to know that. Yeah, let's see how that works. So as we see already, uh, right after this activity, we, we will be able to uh, clearly see how this story relates to us being addicted to God rather than technology. And so we will be able to understand that we can, instead of being addicted to God, we can be talking to God in prayer. Sorry, instead of being addicted to technology, we can be addicted to God in prayer. 
And we can, instead of being addicted to our technology, smartphone, we can be addicted to reading our Bibles. Instead of being addicted to our technology, smartphone, computer, we can start writing small, small songs that will be meaningful and have somebody out there and it will keep us spiritually informed. And the time also we take on our phone, we can get addicted by taking that time to walk to the church. All right, so. All right, so now I'm, I'm gonna talk about um, the social struggles that teens have because they are addicted to their phones. So um, iGeners don't really go out to meet their friends anymore. They meet their friends on their phones and they really avoid social gatherings at all costs. They don't wanna be around people. All communication which iGeners have is really through technology. They use, um, and they're used to communicating in abbreviated sentences, using emojis. They're used to, th this is how they express themselves. They don't even really um, have phone calls. They're not used to having long or short um, conversations. Twenge suggests that, um, that they struggle with what to say, how to say it, and to keep a conversation going at all. It's, it's really foreign to them. They're so used to just typing things out. And I am a millennial, but like I said, I'm, at, I'm towards the end, and I definitely relate to the iGeners. And I, I was a social kid, but in college, I started to really struggle with socializing, and that's really when technology was a really big part of my life. I, um, and I hate social interactions now. I get really stressed out by small talk, not knowing what to say or exactly how to say it. And I always prefer um, text and emails to phone calls. So I can see that technology kind of changed how I interact with people. I can recognize that. So um, lacking social skills has a few kind of youth ministry implications. First of all, the teens might not be super comfortable in a youth group event. They might not be comfortable interacting with one another. It might also limit how they express their faith and express how they're feeling. And it could limit um, their relationships, especially with people that they just bump into in their daily lives. It's difficult to love your neighbor if you don't even talk to them, if you're not willing to reach out to them when you meet them. So um, iGeners are also likely to struggle in interviews. So I've designed a bit of an activity which will um, help the youth group to um, improve their communication skills. It's a youth minister's job really to walk with teens throughout their lives and support them in their daily struggles, just like this. It's important for youth ministers to really just try to um, help them. So I would hold an event for um, middle schoolers and high schoolers at the church, and this event will be framed as a way for teens to prepare for job and college interviews, but just really to help them with social skills in general. So I have a video I'm going to play which describes um, one man's challenge with being social. Um, and I'm going to play a specific part of this video which will um, give an idea he had to deal with that to getting better at talking to people or learning any language is to simply get more practice to interact with more people to give your brain more opportunities to observe and learn the unique patterns and rules of this language. Now you might be wondering, improvement pill, okay that makes sense and all, but how do I get more practice? Well, when I was about 18 years old, I decided to take on what's called the 100 Interaction Challenge to improve my social skills. Basically, you have a month to interact with 100 people. It doesn't really matter how deep the interactions are. Heck, you could run up to people and just say hi and then run away, and that would still count as an interaction. The majority of my interactions during this challenge involved asking people for directions while pretending that my phone died and that I was lost. And although these interactions on a surface level seemed very simple and short, I eventually found myself transitioning into deeper conversations. And this actually led to a whole lot of practice for my brain. And I did see a pretty significant boost in my social skills by the time the challenge was over. All right, so um, after we watch this video, we might um, discuss um, what are some topics that we could talk to people about if we bumped into them, if we, we ran into people, what could we talk about? Such as it could be the weather, it could be school, family, um, your hobbies, just get teens to start talking about these ideas. And then um, we're going to do an activity to have little social interactions like he did in the video. And it's going to be kind of like social interaction musical chairs. So um, all of the, the teens are gonna stand around the room and then when the music starts, they have to find somebody and talk to them until the music stops. 
And so, um, and then when the music stops, they find somebody else and then do that again. And we just keep repeating it so that they can have practice with social interactions. Just like he suggests that practice really helps you feel more comfortable and helps you improve your social skills. And also even challenge them if they wanna do this, this 100 interaction challenge, if they wanna try to push themselves to talk to more people and just improve their social skills. And afterward, we can discuss um, what we've learned and talk about if they're gonna take that challenge and just really continue to practice the skills. This could be something that they do um, a variety of different times. Um, yeah, and do, do a variety of different times throughout the year, maybe. So um, I'm gonna talk about the mental health effects of technology on social skills. Um, some of the uh, effects are, are pretty devastating effects. Uh, so I'll start with polarization uh, into rogue mentalities. So Twainy um, speaks about an issue from New York Post article um, where a student didn't see any issues with race or sexuality because no one cares about any of that stuff. And the professor surprisingly also saw this as a norm and said that she had never seen an incident of disrespect. Um, yet the same year, there were several incidences of racial injustice, racism, and um, several microaggressions not just on their campus, but across the country. So the downside of, on, of the online uh, culture is that social media sites connect people um, in their own personal cocoon. Um, Twangy talks a lot about this. And what this does is it allows people to cluster with, together with people who think like they think, further polarizing their views. So this brings to mind a movie from my generation called um, Higher Learning. And back then what kids did was they went around and they posted, uh, posted um, uh, flyers to sort of pull people into their, into their groups and uh, sort of called recruiting for specific groups. Uh, and on the negative side, one of which were skinheads uh, in this movie. Um, so the similarity there ends where social media is concerned, but social media often uh, serves as a veil for um, behind which people can hide until a real issue arises like the Black uh, Lives Matter movement. Then people have to actually come out and choose or with regard to the rogue mentality, what people do is they stay behind that veil and they have these ideologies where they're not interacting with other people, which can uh, become dangerous, especially when uh, people get into a mindset uh, that leads them into the dangers of um, mass shootings and, and such. The other thing um, that happens a lot uh, is anxiety. So Twangy mentions anxiety 42 times in this text, mental health 71 times, depression or depressive, 206 times, panic four times, technology 38 times, polarization 15 times, suicide 93 times. All of these um, negative outcomes from technology are something um, that show us that there's a clear correlation between a lack of social interaction and mental health. Statistics are showing that uh, showing us that two times as many teens commit suicide that than just a few years ago, not generationally, like my generation as opposed to this generation, but just within the last few years, there have been a, a, a significant increase in, in uh, suicide. Uh, so adults have to find a way to place moderation in place, need to put moderation in place um, for how much time kids spend and also the content for which they are observing. Twangy says something very important. Life is better offline and iGeners know it. So it's not like they don't know. They're, they are participating in these activities that are not good for them and they know that they're not good for them. So what happens, I think, um, kids don't really know what or why they feel the way that they do generally and developmentally this doesn't have anything to do with particular generations it's just teenagers in general spend this time trying to figure out who they are what 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 they're feeling why they're feeling what they're feeling and it is up to us as adults and as parents and as youth leaders and uh, to 
sort of help them find their way. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's up to us to change that. So Twangy speaks to, uh, speaks to how to be, how, how to beat it beyond just putting down the phone. So there's exercise, which can get you renewed, um, energy, clarity, and calm. And exercise is a natural antidepressant that has been shown um, scientifically. So there's a six-part program by a man called Stefan Elardi, and he spoke about this in his TED Talk called Depression is a Disease of Civilization. Sunlight exposure, exercise, a diet high in omega-3 fatty acids, avoiding rumination, getting enough sleep, and the key for our purpose is in-person social interaction. So I have an activity, it's an intergenerational youth-sponsored activity. And the purpose of this act, or to put it in context, um, I came up with this activity as a practice in civic engagement um, that was triggered by the lack of resources that were devoted to a youth ministry. And the students are proving that through civic engagement lessons, being taught in the youth meeting will be used to address social issues that they that we ordinarily talk about to address social justice issues can be utilized in a church context environment when deemed necessary in order to be heard and properly funded because that's the issue they're not being properly funded what triggered the need is there was a budget cut to the youth ministry they were overhearing conversations about what these adults or elders thought they knew about the the, the young people and they internalized it as being un, unfocused, bullying, you know, they're anxious, unhappy, and so forth. So the youth are seeking not only funds, but validation for who they are and direction from their elders. So the name of this is called Dear Grown Ups. Grown Ups, forgive us, for we, only, for we are only who you made us. So the activity is who am I and who do you say I am? So the scripture themes are um, Timothy 4.12, which is the United Church of Christ um, quote for, for you. Don't look down. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And for the elders who are participating, um, there's a scripture that, that speaks to, um, to them uh, not lording over the young people, the fact that they are older, but God entrusted them to be examples to the flock. So here's the game. Uh, I'll make this really, really quick. So the Gen Zers um, put on the backs of the elders all of the celebrities who are Gen Zs. And then the, the, the older generation, the Gen Xs and the Boomers put on the backs of the Generation Zers, the celebrities from their era. So here's a list of the Gen Zs, Jojo Siwa, Zendaya, Billy Eilish. Eilish. Okay, next slide. Generation X, that says Princess Diana, Charles Barkley, Mia Hamm, so forth. Okay, so dear grownups. So once they do that activity, um, which should be a lot of fun, um, on post-it notes, Generation Z would write down what they think about the other generation, what they think the other generation thinks about them, and what they want the other generation to know about them, everything that they feel. Then they'll have a discussion, and to, to, keep, it, to keep the discussion spiritual, they just keep in mind the scriptural themes, and then the elders propose solutions on how to stay connected in the midst of changing social landscape, which calls the gener which calls the elders to not only offer their wisdom, but to also understand that that the social landscape is changing, and and for some and, and at some point understand that things aren't going to always be the way they think they should be. So it's sort of a meeting in the middle of the way that technology or what, the way that people communicate through technology. Um, so they, and then they, and then once they do that, they can have a discussion about um, funding priorities and the future of the church because youth are the future of the church. So I just wanted to play, uh, um, I just wanted to play a quick video about what an adult 
sees as a way for um, sees as a way for young people to be heard. Start. I asked my students what they would tell you today if they could be here in my place. And the vast majority of their 265 comments contain outright pleas from your young people to be fully heard and seen by the adults in their lives. They're intensely aware of our indifference and they're writhing under the weight of it. Our teenagers do not need more likes. They need the flesh and blood humans they admire most, you and I, to take them seriously. But while many of us have passed on global ideologies like the value of hard work and equality, in too many instances, I fear that we have failed, I have failed, to look individual humans in the eye, take them by the hand, and reassure them that they are of immeasurable worth, that there is no mistake or life circumstance from which they cannot recover, that our ideas matter, that we trust them with our collective future, in less than a year, many of them will be going to the ballot boxes. Five to 10, they will be building your homes and filling your prescriptions. Give them a couple more and they will be cracking open your sternum to run a bypass through your failing heart. This is the generation that holds our lives in their hands. And the strength of that grip when you and I reach the ends of our rope might in large part be determined by how much trust we choose to bestow upon them today. So at the end of um, the video, which I think speaks very well to the fact that our generation Zers who have all these issues are not responsible for their own demise. They, they aren't doing this alone. Um, there's a bonding activity where there's a burning ceremony where everyone will take their post-it notes and then they'll go to the fire and then they'll burn them all. And after that, um, you know, there'll be hot dogs and marshmallows and so forth. And hopefully this activity isn't just about the adults telling the younger people what they're doing wrong, but for them to take responsibility for the things that need to be that they need to do while pulling the generation Zers into um, social interaction and also allowing them to moderate their uh, technological te their technological behavior um, while they're communicating. So that's my activity. All right, that's our presentation.